morning, New Life. We hope you're doing well. Worship with us. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions, bright and blessed, He prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim path with clouds will over spread the sky. But when try days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we walk into hell, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Pray. 
Good morning, New Life. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12. Uh, we'll start in verse 14 this morning, uh, so you can be uh, looking that up in, in the Scriptures or on your device, however you want to do that if you uh, choose to follow along this morning. Um, so I am super excited at the fact that we are going to come back together corporately uh, here in a few weeks. Uh, the 31st uh, of May is going to be our regathering service, and man, we are excited uh, for that day when we get to get back together uh, and celebrate all of who Jesus is and what He has done. Um, and so that Sunday is going to be, um, man, we, we are so excited about it. What we're going to do is this, is we're going to take every precaution possible uh, to keep us as safe as possible. So we'll practice social distancing, we'll do some different things like that and be rolling out some videos uh, over the next few weeks just to kind of keep you um, updated on what that will look like and what that will mean for us as we interact with one another. Um, I mean, we, we're family, and so we want to uh, act like family when we get together. And so I know there'll be that tendency to, uh, uh, man, to, to do some things that, that may not be in our best interest at this time. And so, like I said, we'll roll out some of those things. We'll have ushers that'll help us find seats. We'll uh, uh, social distance in the sanctuary, even our children's ministry. We're going to limit uh, how many kids we have in classrooms, um, if you feel comfortable with putting your kids in a classroom. Th- those type of things will all be optional and will be there to help just serve, uh, to serve you. And so, but we'll be rolling those type of things out. Uh, the big thing that's changing on the 31st is this, is that we are no longer gathering here on campus at 9 a.m. in the morning. We are moving our worship service back to 10 a.m. 10 a.m., so the 31st, mark it on your calendar, Set your alarms, all of those things. We are going to meet and gather at 10 a.m. here at New Life Baptist Fellowship. And so I'm not going to give you too much information on why we're going to do that. Um, uh, as over the next few weeks, as we prepare and as we get ready, when you gather here, we're going to share uh, the heart behind why we're moving our services back to 10 a.m. And so um, we're excited about that. God has just really pressed upon uh, my heart some things that I feel like that we need to press into and we need to do a better job at uh, as his body, as his bride, uh, in reaching our world and accomplishing the things that he has called us to do and be. And so uh, we will be changing our times to, uh, to line up with that, to, to come alongside and to line up with what our vision and mission is here at New Life Baptist Fellowship. And so the 31st will be... Uh, our kickoff service of uh, looking to the future of who God wants us to be and starting to follow uh, that out. And then again, through the summer, we'll start to kind of reveal some of those plans uh, as what God has pressed upon our hearts here as leadership of this church to be uh, going after. And so uh, we're excited for that. So don't forget, 10 o'clock, the 31st, we will meet and gather here in this place. We are also that morning going to celebrate our graduates. We had already planned to uh, use that Sunday as a Sunday to celebrate those students who are going to be graduating high school. And again, I know that this is uh, crazy times, different times, and things are going to look different for them moving forward as it pertains to graduation, as it pertains to um, the summer, all of those type of things. And so we want to just celebrate our graduates that morning as well. And so we'll be rolling out more information too as Tyler gets a hold of uh, the parents of those graduates as well as those graduates to kind of keep you uh, up to date on what we've got planned there. Uh, but again, we are excited that we finally get to come together and worship. And so I'm going to ask you if you'd join me this morning as we pray. Um, and then we'll jump into where we're going to be this morning. We'll, we'll recap for a moment, and then we'll, we'll look forward to what God's got for us this morning uh, in His Word. So join me as we pray. Father, we love you. Jesus, we need you. got a very tough scripture to look at this morning, uh, a very difficult and weighty scripture to just wrestle with in our soul. And so, Father, I pray this morning as we, uh, as we watch, as we listen, God, as we hear your word proclaimed, Father, that your Holy Spirit would start to, to move in our lives, start to move in our hearts and soften us in those areas where we need to be more obedient. God, maybe in those areas where we've become hardened, maybe in those areas where there's some sin that has crept in, God, I pray that, that you would just reveal, God, that to us, that you would move and speak in a mighty way. God, change our hearts. God, may your Holy Spirit have freedom, Lord, as we listen and hear your word proclaimed. God, do a work in the life of the people that call themselves yours. And and Father, maybe for someone this morning that's watching uh, uh, on the web or watching through Facebook Live, God, maybe maybe this morning is the morning that you call them to yourself. God, that you rescue them from, from sin that you rescue them from themselves. And so, Father, I just pray, Lord Jesus, if that be the case, God, that you would start to soften the heart of the one who needs you as Savior. God, move in a mighty way this morning. We beg of you. We plead with you. God, we are excited to see what you're going to do in the life of this church. God, as we get to start back 
gathering corporately. God, help prepare our hearts for what you have for us now as well as in the future. Jesus, we love you, we need you, and we thank you for what you're going to accomplish this morning through your word. In your name we pray. Amen. So last week we were in Romans 12, 12, where Paul just provides us with, with three key, uh, um, vital keys to responding to hardships, to responding to difficulties. He says that we need to choose joy and hope, that we need to be patient, and that we need to pray. And so that's what we looked at last week and just dove into. And so this morning what Paul's going to do, he's going to encourage us in our relationship with one another, explaining how to be a community of of brothers and sisters in Christ, explaining what it looks like to be a a part of the family of God, Uh, even having to work through some of those difficulties, working through some of uh, those struggles that that may arise as a result of, of being family together, as well as a result of things that may come at us from those who are not a part of the family. So he's going to break that down. He's going to walk through some of those things with us. And so first, what we're going to do is we're going to need to enter into uh, the joy of others uh, by delighting and being glad when others are experiencing successes, when good things happen to other people. We need to celebrate that. We need to be excited for those blessings and those type of situations that take place in life, as well as walking into those areas where there's brokenness, where there's messiness, where there's struggles, where there's difficulties for us to uh, 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 struggle well together, for us to love and care for each other enough to walk through some of that together and respond in a way that honors Christ. And so he says those two things immediately following a very heavy and weighty statement about blessing those who do bad to you. I mean, how difficult is that? To bless those, to have that heart, to bless someone who, who mistreats you, who, who uh, does difficult things to you. But what can we do? I mean, we can always go back and we can look in the Scriptures and we can allow the Scriptures to resonate in our hearts, can't we? We can go back and we can see those times where Jesus is a living example of exactly what the Apostle Paul is teaching here in Romans 12. So I just think for a moment of Jesus on the cross, right? He has, Jesus has every opportunity on the cross to come off that cross any time that he wants to. Well, because he's still God in the flesh. And then at any moment, he has at his disposal these legions of angels to come and rescue him and rightfully show this wicked and, and, and sinful people who he is. But what does he do? He restrains from that, does he not? He knows what's at stake. And so what does Jesus do? He doesn't respond that way. No, no, he, he responds in a much different way. How he prays for those who are crucifying him. He, he prays for and asks God to, to move in their life. Uh, the thieves on the cross, he shows mercy and grace to. So, so we see Jesus like that, having every opportunity to move in a way that would benefit him, but he doesn't. And so Jesus also, as we're going to look at the Scriptures this morning, we're going to see in His life as, as He gets to celebrate His disciples. I mean, He gets to enter into that joy of celebrating them, like in Luke 10, uh, 17 through 21, where Jesus declares that he is, uh, he is full of joy through the Holy Spirit. And so we often think of Jesus as what is this man of sorrows and difficulties. Yet Jesus was also filled with joy, is what the book of Hebrews and the book of Psalm teaches us. All of those declare that God was what anointed with this oil of joy. And so Jesus had a joy in him, and he spread that joy to his disciples and to those that he came in contact with. Like we see in Matthew 16, 13 through 18, when Jesus asks his disciples, hey, who, who's everybody saying that I am? Uh, what's the word? What's the buzz on the street about me? Who, who, what, what's the chatter that's happening out there? And so they begin to tell him of, of these prophets and all of these uh, people that Jesus could be. And then in that moment, what does Jesus do? He just pauses. And I can just imagine this intense moment with his disciples as he looks them in the eye and he says, okay, but, but who do you say that I am? And what do we know? We know Peter steps up, takes the challenge, and he responds in such a way as, to, as, as, for, God to, as for God in the flesh, as for Jesus to celebrate the reality of what Peter has said. He says, yes, Peter, that's right. He says, upon this rock I'll build my church. Not the rock Peter, but on the statement, the weighty statement that Jesus Christ is the living Son of God. That's the very foundation upon which his church is built. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus celebrates that in the midst of his disciples. 
So we see Jesus living this out in front of his disciples, as well as the last thing that we'll look at this morning with this being hurt and moved by the hurt of others. In John chapter 11, what happens? Jesus comes into town and his good friend Lazarus has died. And those, those people there that he is close to, he's, he's hurt and he is moved by what's taking place with Lazarus. And so we see Jesus in that scripture in John 11 weep because Jesus is broken over the fact of losing someone close to him and those that he is close to. He is broken over the fact of their hurt and their pain. And so as the body of Christ, when we are faced with difficult truths in the Scriptures, what can we do? We can always flash back to the life of Jesus and follow His example. Follow His example. And we'll see that all here as we look through the book of Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 14. So all of the commands that we're going to look at over the next two weeks, they're going to assume that something deeper has happened in your soul. We're going to assume that something greater has happened in your heart. Because all of these commands are rooted uh, in the freedom from self-preoccupation and self-delight. We've been removed from that. It's not about me. It's not about me. And that's what happens when we enter into relationship with Christ. It frees us up from us. It gets us out of the way. See, these commands, they are rooted They are rooted in the preoccupation of Christ. And there's a delight in Christ. That's what we're going to see in these commands. And so what we could do is we could go back to verse 1. And we could look at these words, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. And we could start there and we could break those down and look at that and how it connects to where we're going to be at this morning. And how uh, us being obedient to what Paul is going to ask us to do or tell us to do, how us being obedient to that uh, is because of us being overwhelmed by God's mercy and God's grace. But I want to go a different route this morning. I want to look at Romans 12, 3 for just a moment before we jump into our main text this morning. And, And this is what Paul writes. He says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So the alternative of thinking too highly of ourselves, this, pre, uh, this self-preoccupation or this self-delight, which is the root of all sin, is to look away from self and to look to Jesus and behold His beauty, behold His glory. And then notice... One other thing in verse 3 that I believe is so relevant to commands like this. Especially when we're going to see here in a moment where Paul says, Bless those who persecute you. Weep with those who weep. See, verse 3 tells us to think with sober judgment, each according, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned, that God has given Paul says that the measure of faith that we have is what? Is a gift from God. That God bestows this upon us. It's God who gives you the good gift of faith. The ability to be able to believe. The the ability to be able to, to trust and walk in that. I mean, think on that for a moment. Be fixated on that for a moment. That it's a good gift of God for us to be able to believe. That He opens up our heart. He opens up our mind. He does a work in us that allows us to have the faith to believe. If it wasn't for Him, we would never be able to obey this. We would never be able to walk in this. We would never be able to to be obedient to what He's called us to be obedient to, to what the Apostle Paul is going to share with us this morning. And so I say all of that to help us get our eyes and our affections off of us because church hear me if we have even an ounce of self we will never be able to do what Paul's going to tell us here in in Romans 12 we'll never be able to do it If, if we keep our eyes focused on us our eyes fixated on us we will never be able to live out this deep heavy weighty truth that Paul's going to give us And so this morning what we're going to see is we're going to see three kinds of people. We're going to see those who persecute us, those who rejoice, and those who weep. Romans 12, 14. Let's jump in. This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Notice how what what kind of a radical behavior this is. This verse doesn't just say, don't retaliate. It doesn't say not to just do something to them because they've done something to you. It doesn't say that. 
So the point here is not only our behavior, what it's our heart. It's our motive. There's this partial quote from Jesus in Luke 6, 28, where, where Jesus says this. He says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Uh, is that not crazy? Of course Jesus would say something like that, right? Uh, of course we know that he, he would bust onto the scene and he would, he would say something like this. Instead of get even, instead of take it to the next level, instead of retaliate, the, you've got this right to do. No, no, no. Jesus says, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. And so what we see here with this word pray, it shows that behavior is not only the issue. See, prayer is voicing to God what you long for. Prayer is going before the throne of God and making your needs known. It's voicing in the ear of God what you long for, what you desire, what you want. So blessing someone is not just found in what? The way that you treat them. Oh, that takes it to a whole new level, does it not? Blessing someone is not just found in the way that you treat them, how you respond to them. No, no, it includes the longings that you have for someone. It includes the desires that you have. That's hard stuff. That's deep level stuff that we have to work through, especially to those who have abused us or those who have hurt us or those who have mistreated us or taken advantage of us. He says, bless them and pray for them. Pray for what? For their good now and forever. That's what we're to pray for. I mean, is this not hard? Is this not difficult? I mean, this can't just be mustered up out of self-will, out of self-desire, out of just trying a little bit harder, smiling a little bit more. It can't just be mustered up. It has to be a move of God in the heart of His people. Nobody's going to respond or act or live this way. Uh, the world would say only a fool would do that. Hey, well, what the, the, the saying of the world is what? I don't get mad, I get even. You're going to hurt me, I'm going to retaliate. I have the right to respond and do now in a way that benefits me. But that's not what Paul is teaching and that's not what Jesus would teach. So it has to be the work of the Holy Spirit in the heart of man to be able to live this out. And so if I could just be honest for a moment and just pull back the curtain of my life, me as your pastor, me as a follower of Jesus, there are times where I'm like, God, get him. God, sick him. Oh, God, make him hurt. God, make them struggle. God, God get him. Or there'll be times in, in my heart, and, and, and you, this is not verbalized. No, no, we're, we're, much, we're much more, and your pastor, right, I'm, you, I'm much more dignified than that. Now, I've, I've got this perception of holiness to keep up, right? That's how we do it as a church. That's how we do it as believers in today's world, is it not? I mean, all this stuff is in, internal, so nobody can see it, and so we really got a handle on it, which I would say is one of the darkest places to be because what's the most scariest is what people can't see. In all reality, that's exactly what God hears, knows, and is aware of. And so there'll be sometimes in my life where I'll be happy when something doesn't go all that great for someone. Like, ha, ha, ha. And what God would say in my life, especially as I was looking and reading and breaking this apart this week, is that there's some sin issues in my heart. Because that's contrary to the Scriptures, is it not? That thought, that mentality, that heart goes against the very thing, the very principle that, that, that Paul is teaching here, that, that the Holy Spirit has inspired Paul to write and pen and to tell the believers at Rome, to tell us here today that that attitude and that heart and that desire is contrary and that's sin. So as I've looked and as I've studied and as I've read and as I've dove into this, this week, and God has just wore me out with this reality. Scott, who, who, in your life do you have something against? Who in your life are you not praying that I would bless and move in a mighty way in them? Who, even those who have done wrong against you, even those who have mistreated you, even those who have said things falsely on your account, even those who have acted in, uh, in a way that has come against you? And so I guess maybe this morning what I would ask you is this, who do you need to be praying for in your life? Who, who right now do you need to pray for in your life that God would do this? That God would bless 
them, that God would move in their life. You think about that for a moment. Maybe in the moment even of the sermon, sermon and the scriptures being proclaimed, God in His good grace, by way of the Holy Spirit, would stir up in your heart this reality of someone maybe that you've got a vendetta against, that you've got a hardship toward, somebody that maybe has mistreated you, said some things about you. Because the reality is this, if you live long enough, you're going to upset and frustrate people. You're going to, there's going to be jealousy, there's going to be tension, there's going to be things that happen. And more than likely, you're probably aware of that, and you probably know, you probably feel, feel some of that. And so my question is, who do you need to pray for this morning? Who has God stirred maybe in your heart this morning as, as I began to read and break down some of this? And so this way of living, church, can only come from Christ. It can only come from a relationship with Jesus See, when we see that Christ is all sufficient, when we see that He is enough, then we can settle in and we can live out this. See, living this way comes not from thinking highly of ourselves or thinking more than we ought of ourselves, but what? Seeing ourselves in light of the way that Jesus sees us. Broken, sinful and wicked and in great need of Him. And when you start to look through those lenses, that starts to shape and mold your heart all the more in the way that it should be. So he goes on and he says this, Paul, he says this, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice. It's this thought of being glad in the blessings and honor and welfare of others, no matter what your situation is. And so this is the heart behind uh, all that Paul is saying. And so I just love the story in John chapter 3, where we kind of get to see this example lived out. See, when the reports of Jesus' success, it comes to John the baptizer there and, and his influence over the Israelites was starting to decrease some. And so this was John's response. This is what he says. He says, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said that. I'm not the Messiah, but I'm, I am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it's now complete. He must become greater, and I must become less. What happens here? John takes his eyes off of himself. He understood that there was something much greater at stake. He was excited no matter what. Why? Because Jesus was being made known. All glory was going to Christ. That was his heart. That was his desire. And so that's how we can live that out when we see life's not about us, but it's about Jesus, making much of Jesus. We can celebrate with those, rejoice with those when good things happen. He goes on, he says this, he says, weep with those who weep. So what Paul does here is he instructs us to just mourn with those who mourn. He's saying we need to be sensitive or we need to be compassionate what to the hardships and sorrows of others. By learning to weep with those who weep, we can enter into the pain of others. And in that pain, and in that hurt, what we can do is we can minister what? The love and the peace that only comes from Jesus. We can bring that into that relationship and we can walk with those through the difficulties and the struggles and the hurts. See, when people are hurting, merely just being with them and just weeping and crying with them it's some of the greatest ministry that you can provide. We don't always have to have the answers. We don't always have to have all the words. We don't always have to try to give them a cute little Bible verse to make them feel better. I think just presence is what matters. Just being there. Being an ear to hear what they have to say without even giving feedback unless they want it. Just being in the room with someone that's hurting means more than we can ever Ever, ever know. Ever know. And we see Jesus do this all the time, don't we? We see him act that way, as I've already said, with Lazarus. He was broken there. Also, what we can see in the Old Testament is you see Job's friends. They did this at first. They started off good, but they ended horribly. Job 2.13 says, tells us this, when, when they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights, no one said a word to him. Because they saw how great his suffering was. They're just there in his presence. They're just there with him. They're just mourning with him. 
But it's when they open their mouths and they attempt to offer their wisdom and their understanding that takes this story downhill quickly. And so all of this comes down to getting our eyes and our desires off of self and looking toward others through Christ. Through Christ. So we can rejoice with those who rejoice. We can mourn with those who mourn. Why? Because we're not looking to us. It's not about us. It's not to benefit us. It's, it's to be the hands and feet of Jesus to them. It's to be Jesus in the flesh for someone that's hurting, for someone that's celebrating. It's to, it's to be Him in this world. But isn't it easier to do whenever there's someone who we have close relationship with? When it's with someone who doesn't aggravate us or frustrate us? It's so much easier to do it then. But Paul doesn't set this Scripture up that way, does he? No, no, no. He, he says... To bless those who persecute you. To bless those who aggravate you. To pray for those people who, who treat you a certain way that's, that's, that's not acceptable and not right. That's what he tells the believers here at Rome to do. And that's what Jesus, Jesus would echo. That's what Jesus would tell his followers to do. I mean, to pray for what? To, to pray for their soul. To pray for their eternity. To pray for their heart. Oh, that, that they would be awakened to the reality of who Jesus is. And, and hear me. When we live this way, when we act this way in this current world of difficulty and of struggle and of people taking advantage of us and people using us and people abusing us, and I know as I say that how ridiculous and crazy it sounds because everything even in me says, no, fight for what you deserve. Go after what you've worked so hard for. Don't let someone tear you down. Don't let someone mistreat you. Don't let someone abuse you. And so when we fight and we try to defame them and we try to tear them down and we try to belittle them, it does nothing for the glory and honor of Christ. Nothing. I mean, but when we respond in a way that is peaceful, in a way that looks for the betterment even of the person that uses and abuses us, oh man, how God can... How God can work in that to rescue and redeem lost man. Oh, how God will work. So entering into people's pain can be a very, very challenging thing for us. It can be very difficult. It can be very hard. And let me give you a few reasons real quick as we start to wind down. The reason why it can be hard is one is the fear of not knowing what to say or what to do. It's awkward. It's hard to enter into those moments. But remember, as I said earlier, we don't need to say anything. We just need to be present. We just need to listen as they talk. An another reason why it can be difficult to enter into this season is because we're busy. I mean, life throws a lot at us, does it not? And so weeping with those who are hurting, it takes time. It takes a lot of time. Yet Jesus went out of his way to do what? Comfort those who are in pain. A third reason could be this, being afraid that you won't be able to answer their questions properly. You won't be able to answer their questions properly. We aren't there to provide answers, but we're there to provide comforts. You don't even need to enter into it with that thought. I mean, I'm just here to just be here to be present. And I think another reason why it can be difficult is because we're worried that we can't fix their sorrow. To make sure it's not our job to fix them. Their healing will be a journey with who? The Father. Only God can fix them. So, so being... A follower of Jesus means that we will be persecuted. And how we respond matters. We've got to get our eyes off of us. We've got to look first to Jesus and we've got to behold His beauty. Get our eyes on the cross and what He's done for us. See, when we do that, we can respond in such a way that, that brings Him glory. And when it brings Him glory, it points people to Himself. So may we grow and mature to the point that when we're in a situation of persecution, or difficulty, that we bless those who persecute us, that we rejoice with those who triumph uh, in, in good things, and that we weep with those who enter into suffering, and we come alongside and we care for. And may God, through the Holy Spirit, use this difficult truth to bring you all the more into maturity. I mean, I just believe this reveals all the more how mature we are in Christ by how we respond and do and live difficult scriptures and truths like this out. May you live this out in such a way that points people to the very heart and nature of Jesus.
Church, thank you for listening this morning, man. I know this is difficult. I know this is tough, but may you look for opportunity. And I believe it starts with praying for. And God will prepare the stage. God will open up the door. God will show you what to do next in, in the lives of those who persecute and who hurt and who try to tear down. But what we've got to do is we've got to enter into this difficult truth and allow the Holy Spirit to direct us, to lead us, and to guide us. May God bless you. I want to pray for you as we close. God, speak to the hearts of the people. God, move in a mighty way. Help us land at this place. Help us rest in this difficult truth. It's in your glorious name we pray. Amen. Hope you have a great week. of eternal promise Stirring in your sons and daughters Earth revealing heaven's wonders Spirit come Spirit come What you spoke is now unfolding All your children shall be holding Dreams awaken in this moment Spirit come, Spirit come Pour it out, let your love run over Here and now, let your glory feel Let your love run over here and now. Let your glory fill this house. Now the world awaits your presence, and this power is with. As we hold to this 
voice assurance spirit come spirit come spirit come spirit come spirit come let your love run over here and now let your glory Huh?